Sometimes I just need to be there for you, you know, just like I just need to be your little sort of cuddle buddy, right? I just have to hold you and let you cry into my shoulder for two hours without yeah. really saying a word. It felt like it was poisoning our marriage. Like the first year of our marriage was one of the worst years yeah, of our lives. It was bad. You don't need to know what it feels like. You just need to be there for me. Mm -hmm. Hello my friends, Amy Esther here, and welcome to part two of my Q&A with my husband. We're answering your questions about being married to someone who lives chronically ill. I have multiple chronic illnesses. We talk about them all over my channel. You can learn more about them in the links below. But since this is part two, we are just gonna get going on the questions. So let's go. question I have here is how can I help my husband deal with my illness and everything it brings? Uh, that's a hard question because it sort of depends on what aspects of your illness are the most difficult for him uh, and what are the most difficult for you. Um, for example, I would say that the hardest thing with Amy is her dieting. It's, it's all about what she can and can't eat because there's nothing more frustrating to me then another night where for 30 minutes she's complaining about how hungry she is. But then no matter what I say, she says, well, that'll make me sick. That doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> and it's a true it's conversation. Oh, it's, and it's, it's extremely difficult to, to talk to her in that way. And I quickly move from like having sympathy and trying to help. And my dial just turns and I'm like, okay, now I'm just annoyed, you know? Um, so in that sense, you know, it's, and I know it's unfortunate and it's hard for both of us, but in that sense, we try to help each other avoid those conversations by, you know, if we have to pull the ejector seat cord of, you know what, we just need to go out and get, you know, sushi or, you know, something that is maybe a little bit more expensive, but really helps her feel better, doesn't make her very sick and, you know basically allows us to to reroute and avoid those conversations that makes it much easier for me uh mentally and emotionally to to connect and to stay sympathetic and stay you know helpful to her yeah i feel like we have these like yeah like an ejector seat mm -hmm. things like he has like sushi is the thing where he's like she'll always eat this and i think part of it is like okay it is more expensive so I'm, like, I'm definitely gonna eat this if he just bought this for me. So sometimes he's just like, I'll just come home. With I'm sushi. not even going to ask. I'm just going to go get you this. And it, I mean, it doesn't have to be sushi, but just having almost like a go-to thing. Someone else asked about actually family dinners, like what we do when I'm not feeling good for dinners. And we have just like our quick go-to things that, mm -hmm. um, whether it's a frozen meal, if you know, if you don't want to spend a lot of money, you could have frozen meals that are go-to things if it's food related. Um, but same thing with activities. Maybe you have a date planned. We'll have a backup. Mm -hmm. We always have a backup where if if I'm feeling terrible, what's our plan B? And even if we yeah. have family parties, you know, it's like, okay, is plan B we both stay home or is plan B I stay home and you go by yourself? We just always have that backup plan so that we know, like we both are on the same page with what's going to happen if, you know, if I don't feel good or, or whatever. So hopefully that answered that question next we have what were your thoughts finding out that i have pots and pots etc so well i mean for pots specifically when we found out it was actually really nice because we didn't know what she had before that yeah we were really happy <laughs> um so you know in a way i'm i'm kind of i'm gonna kind of change your question i'm gonna say the question is more like how did we feel when our lives changed because of how sick she got? Yeah, that's probably more what they were asking. Because, you know, yeah, when a lot, I'm sure a lot of people watching who are, who have chronic illnesses, um, you know, when they find out what it is so that they can start taking steps, that's when it gets a lot better. Yeah. But when she got sick enough that we started to see this complete change in our lives where, you know, a lot of activities and foods and, and you know, those sorts of things just sort of dropped off the menu for us. Uh, I mean, it was, it was a slow process, you know, it happened over the course of months and even years. 
Um, but it felt a little bit like, like poison. It felt like it was poisoning our marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't want to use the term bait and switch because that's, it was not intentional in any way. There was, it was no baiting, but you know, it felt like, like life had, yeah, like life had bait and switched us. And we were just like, well, this is not what I thought our marriage was going to be. Um, and so, yeah, it was very painful and, and very difficult. I mean, we always said that um, the best part of our marriage in the first year was the marriage and everything else was the worst <laughs> year of our lives. Yeah, that's so true. Like ev- like the first year of our marriage was one of the worst years yeah, of our lives. It was bad. But the only good part about it was that we had each other. Yeah. Um, that we could go through it together. So, yeah, I mean, it was extremely, extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, okay. How do you keep appreciation for your partner when they're in their weakest moments? So I'm guessing that's like physical weakness. I think it could be, I mean, or I guess for both of us, like just any weak moments. How about you start? Uh, Well, I feel like, okay. So if we're talking about like emotional weakness, I feel like we both have days where you know, you're just in a bad mood, right? Whatever reason, maybe it's I'm feeling really sick and then I'm taking it out on him. Um, and so we talk about that a lot. Like we often will talk about like being in those like emotional, like that emotional mm-hmm. state and how, like there are times where you're emotional and I'm not it's like I'm I just know that that's your time to be frustrated or annoyed and I and just like allowing you to feel that way and then you do the same for me where it's like you don't even try like we used to try to change that we used to been like why aren't you in a good mood right now let's get you in a good mood and now it's almost like we're just allowing each other to you know be a little frustrated be a little angry and like just have your time and then I know it like he knows that like okay in an hour I can talk to her and she'll say sorry for what she said or or like and vice versa yeah like we just know that that time's going to pass and we're going to you know um, like think more logically in, Mm -hmm. in an hour or two or so yeah um and again you know there's there's gonna be small differences to large differences maybe for each individual couple but i mean there's no two words that are worse to say to an angry person than calm down and it, the same goes for someone who's feeling very very emotional and ill um physically or you know in whatever way you don't want to go up to him and be like why are you sad you know hey tell me what's wrong it's like it should be obvious you know or it's so obvious to that person that they probably feel frustrated that they even have to say it out loud um yeah i I would say time is your friend you know just like time will heal all wounds you also want to give time a minute to to sort of you know blow off that steam in a way let yourself cool down let your let your emotions because you know nobody can live <clears throat> with their emotions just ratcheted up all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know there are people with certain conditions that make it harder to you know calm down. Um, you know there are those with bipolar disorder and there are those with that high anxiety where they they really do live in those high registers. Um, but typically for most people. It's it's just a, it's a question of letting yourself reach an emotional equili- equilibrium before you try to really sort of fix anything, you yeah. know. Yeah, because when we're any time we're in that emotional state, our conversations are not mm-hmm. useful. Like yeah. we just, it, especially if we're both in that emotional state, and usually if one of us is, and then the other one's trying to calm them down, then we end up like mirroring each other yeah. and adding to that so yeah I definitely think just allowing each other to and not that we're perfect at this but that's the times where we do the best is when we just allow each other to you know have those weak moments and then 
we have conversations about it later. Yeah. Like if it is a big problem, we'll talk about it later when we're gonna... now. Now, word of warning: that doesn't just mean, "Hey, I can see that you're at your very worst. I'm gonna leave you alone yeah. for a little <laughs> while. You know, once you've calmed down, we can talk." That's not at all what we're talking about. Sometimes I just need to be there for you. You know, just like I just need to be your little sort of cuddle buddy, right? I just have to hold you and let you cry into my shoulder for two hours without yeah. really saying a word. Yeah, sometimes like I just need to sit and complain and cry and or be angry. Like you just kind of sometimes need those moments. So. Watch It's Not About the Nail on YouTube. Yeah, that's That's good. a pretty funny video and it's yeah, very true. It is. Um, and then I feel like if they were talking about like physical weakness, like how to help your partner and their weakest moments that way, it's kind of the same thing. Just mm -hmm. like we talked about having a backup plan for things, first of all. And then also he just allows me to feel sick for a while. Wow. He allows me to not, I mean, he's really good at not getting frustrated at, you know, me, at my illness. I've tried to get better. Yeah. I wasn't always... But you're like, if I can't, you know, make dinner, you, you don't get frustrated at me. Mm -hmm. At least you don't show it. So yeah. maybe you do. And then you go scream in a pillow. <laughs> but <laughs> I haven't noticed it. Um, okay. Advice to others on how to not lose heart when your partner has illness. I don't know what that means. That's a deep one. Oh, I, I think I get what the question is going for. <sighs> it's cliche, but things will get better you just have to push for it you just have to keep trying yeah and i'm not even when i say keep trying i'm not even saying you know keep seeing doctors until they figure it out because you know odds are a doctor won't be able to help you um now that being said you know see your doctor but if you've seen three or four and there's a few specialists in there and nobody can really find it it could be that you know, it's something that's either unclassified or is just, it would require such a level of specialization that you maybe just don't have access to that. But getting better is the goal always. We, we want to see our partners get healthy and, and be happy. And I think that's the real key there is, is to be happy. Um, because as, for example, in our situation, as you get happier, as you sort of come to grips and, and become more accepting of yourself and, and your illness, uh, it makes me happier because then all I have to do is be happy with you. Right. Right? Be happy for the progress and... Well, it's kind of... Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. It's kind of like I was saying where we... If one of us is angry, the other one mirrors that person. It's like the same thing. If I'm not upset about my illness, it's easier for you to not be upset about it. Right? Absolutely. Especially because I'm the one feeling it and you, you know, you don't even, it's hard for you to know. I think we had a question here about that. I can't remember where it is, but like, what do you do? Like, how do you empathize with me? Yeah. And I think in some ways, it just, you don't, you don't need to, like, you don't need to know what it feels like. You just need to be there for me. Mm -hmm. Next question. How do you keep balance on romance and health and babies? How do you best show appreciation and care for an ill partner? Romance and health and babies. Boy, I mean, now that you list them all out, how do we do it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> balance. I mean, this is something I've been struggling with a lot recently yeah. is balance, right? I feel very out of balance. And, and for me, it's really because, like babies. They make it really hard because they are... You give every ounce of everything to those babies. Um, and so I'm definitely struggling with that right now. So when I figure that out, I'll let you know. But Josh is a little bit better at balance. Why don't you share? I just, you know, a lesson I learned, you know, when I, I mean, I wish I had learned it earlier. But the, the core of balance is always going to be you. Because if you're not doing well, if you are out of balance in, in your wants and desires, but also in your responsibilities and obligations, um, then nothing around you is going to get better. So I just always have to stay very attuned to my own feelings and my own, you know, like I said, wants, needs, responsibilities, and obligations. I'm going to list them out like that. Uh, and 
if I notice or if I can think of any of those things that are out of whack or out of balance, that's what I have to focus on pretty much as my top priority. So if I think to myself, you know, I just have not really connected with, you know, my baby, my son, then I just need to, whatever I'm doing, I just got to drop it and I got to play with him. Babies is a really good example because they do take so much of your time and energy like to survive, right? <laughs> in order to survive, they have to. And as they get older, you know, it takes less and less and it's put in different places. And so, you know, you might have to decide, well, what do I put first? So for example, like date nights, maybe while you have babies and young kids, your date nights are more at home. And then just knowing that, again, things will get better and just believing that, okay, we will have more time to go out or to travel or whatever it is you want to do in the future. But right now, the babies are taking up so much of our energy and time that we don't have as much. And so you just have to um, balance that there. And again, I'm not perfect at it, but he he's a great example of that. Um, the next question is the same thing that we already answered. Balancing activities. Um, they did mention traveling though, so let's let's talk about that for a minute. We don't really. We travel. don't. <laughs> yeah. There's and your answer. Just yeah, don't. Just don't do it. <laughs> um, but we've. I mean, we've talked about traveling the future. Right now, mm -hmm. with young kids, it's just way too much energy. Like. The, the energy to go travel somewhere sounds so much harder than, than staying here. Again, where do you want to put your mental energy? If you want your mental energy in in uh, your health and the things that will happen to your health by going and traveling, but you want the experience of traveling, then go do that. But if it's like for me, it's easier to calm my desires to go travel than it is to deal with the side effects of traveling, if that makes sense. But we've talked about it, about going in the future. Mm -hmm. And we've just decided that we are not the kind of people who will travel and do all the tourist things and have, you know, 12 things planned for the day, have our whole day planned out. We would have maybe one activity a day planned. Mm -hmm. We would rent me a wheelchair. We would, like, we would have, you know, kind of adaptations, but we wouldn't have things scheduled so much where it was just more exhausting to travel than it was to stay home. Yeah. If you think of vacation, like your ideal vacation as an apple, uh, sometimes you just got to understand that you're going to have to cut off parts of that apple. You're going to have to, you know, either waste some of the, of what you want, some of that time on the vacation. You're not going to be able to do all the activities. You're not going to eat the whole apple, but that doesn't mean that you can never eat apples. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean you can't go on vacation. You just have to find vacations that are going to work for you. Um, we recently went to a zoo and, you know, that was travel. We took our, our daughter and we rented her an electric wheelchair and exactly. it was actually really good. And, and it made it way, way easier for you mm -hmm. and you didn't even get that sick after. Yeah. So. Yeah, you just kind of have to adapt. And when it comes to like Josh hanging out with friends or going to like hang out with family. Again, we just have a backup plan mm -hmm. for all of it. And we decide together, like if I'm having a really anxious night, then I might say, if I'm not feeling good, I want you to stay here with me. But if I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'll be okay. Why don't you go out as our backup plan? You know, plan A of course is that I go with you and we have a great time. Plan B is you just go by yourself. So, um, okay. Do you feel guilty? For not being able to contribute as much financially as your husband or not being able to do as much as him. I struggle with this immensely, especially on days when I literally can't do anything but lay around with a migraine. Uh, I used to uh, because when we got married, our plan was, so our plan was always that I was a stay-at-home mom eventually. The long-term Yeah, long-term. But when we first got married, I was close to getting my degree and I got it only a couple months after we got married. And our plan was I would work, so we had insurance and money coming in um, for or until my husband graduated. And then once we decided to have kids, then I would stay home. And that was the plan. And then I worked for six months and it was miserable every minute because I was so sick and I quit. And Josh at the time was going to school full time and he was working, I mean, maybe two days a week 
Mm-hmm. We I was working, working like two or three days yeah. a week. Just part time. Yeah. And he ended up having to then finish his school and work work full time and go to school full time for was it two years? Yeah, it was two years. Yeah. And and the last two semesters we had a baby. Yeah. <laughs> so I felt so guilty. I felt like it was so hard for me to quit my job because I knew what he was taking on. Like he was literally gone from 6 a.m. till he'd get back at like 10 at night. 9.30. Yeah. Nine, yeah. yeah, 9 or 10 at night. And then you'd hand me a baby. Yeah, and then those last I'd few months. until midnight. But even before that, like I just felt so much guilt that I couldn't help. And I, and I didn't want to even provide for our family. I didn't want to work forever. And I was like, seriously, just for two years, I can't work and bring in some money. And I literally laid in bed all day and Josh was working and doing school and just working all day long. And it was really, really hard. But again, it just kind of came with time and working on my mental health and working with my life coach and going to therapy and all of that to accept this illness and this new normal. Um, Josh did end up graduating and now his plate is lighter, but still, I mean, he still works full time and he still is the sole provider. I make little bits of money on the side, uh, but I I really only do that for my own mm-hmm. uh, because I like to yeah. do things. And like, <laughs> I mean... I will say this, that, you know, obviously not everyone is going to think the same way that I do, but I didn't blame you for quitting because I could see how miserable it was making you. Yeah. And, you know, I was, if not happy, I was very willing to take on the additional responsibility because I just knew that, you know, the buck stopped with me. I had to just, to just do it. Now, that being said, I never felt uh, manipulated or that that was abused, that that trust and responsibility was abused. I wouldn't get home and then she'd just heap more on my plate and complain to me about, you know, you didn't do this or that. You know, that was never, that was never a thing. Yeah. So, you know, watch yourself. But as the partner, if you're put into a situation like that, I'll just tell you that, yeah, it's really hard and it sucks. And I mean, yeah, I'm sure that my situation is very light compared to what many people have to go through. You know, there's probably people out there working, you know, four jobs just trying to hold it together and and barely can. Um, But just make sure that that's not being abused, that you're not being um, manipulated in that way. And if you feel that way, then find a therapist, find a confidant who can, you know, help you look at that from a third party perspective. Yeah, that was good. Okay, let's do this one last question. If you have any more questions for us, you can always leave them in the comments and we'll get to them in a future video. Uh, But we're going to end this with this question. How do you express to your kids that you are ill and it's not that you don't want to play, it's that you can't? Any tips on spending time with them when you're not feeling well? So I guess this is more directed towards me. Um, So... My kids are pretty young, so I have a nine-month-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old. So my two-and-a-half-year-old is understanding a lot more now. And she's so cute because sometimes she she always brings me antacids <laughs> and says they're like, oh, you need your medicine. And like if I'm not feeling good, she can just tell and she'll bring those to me. Um, but she she's definitely getting more empathetic and noticing when I'm not feeling good. She can tell a lot more now. Um And so what I do as a mom is I have found, again, I have these backup plans. I found things that I can do with my kids when I'm not feeling good. So we, you know, we might do puzzles or read books or uh, like build little block towers, but I have a lot of activities I can do just at home laying on the floor with my kids. Uh, The thing that I... Uh, struggle with is definitely going out. Now we have had COVID this past year, so I don't think anyone's going out that much, but uh, that is something that I often feel guilty about. It's like I do want to take my kids out more. Um, So I have found some things that are easier for me 
Um, and you know, I put them, I, our daughter's in a gymnastics class. So I'll, you know, put them in, in some kind of classes, especially ones that they can do on their own. Um, and then we found like friends that they can hang out with. And so I have a friend, one really good friend who comes over with her kids and we just let the girls play and then we just sit and talk. And so I find, I try to find solutions like that where my kids can still have those experiences. Um, and actually we're moving and part of the reason we're moving is so we have a better yard for our kids to go in where I can rest um, when they're a little bit older, I can be inside and watch them. And even while they're young, I can have a space that I can sit out on the patio with a, you know, with a fan and with a, an umbrella, but that I can be out there with them. So honestly, like I, we've just like changed things that we do so that we both get what we need, right? I get my rest. I get, I don't have to be out in the heat, but then my kids get that time to play and, um, and do those things. So I'm not perfect at it. And again, my kids are young, so I'm sure as the years go on, um, or at least hopefully I'll have more tips for you as my kids get older um, for older kids, but that's that's what I do. Do you have any? Yeah. Anything uh, you want to say I'll about just that? repeat something I said, I think in part one of this video, which is just because you can't do something with them doesn't mean that you can't express interest and also approval, yeah. you know? Uh, if my daughter comes up to me and is like, daddy, I wanna, do somersaults, you know, come do somersaults with me. I can't really do somersaults. I'm, I was never a gymnast. I, I could not really just do a, I think I tried once and I hurt my back. <laughs> I like landed right on my tailbone. But so instead I say, you know, oh, I love your somersaults. I think they're so cool. You know, you look so like talented and, and you're doing it so well. Can you show me? Yeah, and and just good. that can be enough because she gets very excited and you can tell that she just, that's what she really wanted. She just wanted to feel validated. Um, so that's what I would say, you know, validating and, and helping them feel that approval and love uh, from you for the things that they love. Yeah, I love that. Okay, I hope this video was helpful for you. We had part one. If you missed that, go back and watch that one. Make sure you're subscribed to my channel. You don't wanna miss any of the videos that I make if you live chronically ill or you know someone who does because I make videos multiple times a week to help you live an amazing life while living chronically ill. They're pretty good, huh? They are uh, good, Do you yeah. watch them? I, I don't. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't watch them because he's not living I'm chronically living it, baby. ill. I'm living it, baby. But you are, so make sure you are subscribed and I will see you on my next video. Bye.